this is a real privilege and I'm happy to share whatever knowledge I have about neurocognitive disorders. So I have no relevant disclosure. So um, actually, we're gonna structure this into three parts. We're gonna do major neurocognitive disorder, a review of basic and important concepts. Hold on one second, okay. Minor neurocognitive disorders, a brief summary of what this diagnostic entity means, and part three specific issues relating to work in lower and middle income countries. And my, okay. Just want to be. This is the usual. For some reason, this is not working on her previous. Okay, I just have to see. I'm sorry about this. So the goals of the presentation are to understand clinical aspects and progression of the various types of major neurocognitive disorders, to understand how to address or treat, to the extent it's possible, major neurocognitive disorders, understand the global risks associated with them, understand the problems with recognition of minor neurocognitive disorders, and understand the growing impact that increasing presentations of major and minor neurocognitive disorders will have on lower and middle income countries. So let's start with abbreviations. Um, so that I do not become incoherent, we'll, you, we'll say that major neurocognitive disorder becomes major disorder or MD, minor neurocognitive disorder becomes minor disorder, and lower and middle income countries become la mix. And I may lapse into uh, dementia at times because I've been working with that term for many years, but I will try to be good about this. Okay, major neurocognitive disorders, uh, concepts. So what is a disorder of cognition? As with all psychiatric disorders, functional impairment is, in, is observed and is actually a criterion of all of these major uh, psychiatric disorders. Daily function is largely organized by the frontal lobes. And yes, there's a blurring of boundaries. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, and delirium are all characterized by frontal lobe impairment. Are there sine qua nones? In other words, things that are essential to the definition. Yes, a change from baseline behavior or function uh, is, is, that is not accounted for by affective changes and is not a relapsing presentation. In other words, has any chance of improvement. It's inexorably down. Uh, in depression, for example, people stop taking care of themselves and they may not be able to contribute to their work or family in the same way. But this recovers with treatment or at least partially recovers. In dementia, the course may be slow at times, but there is never any recovery. So global trends, um, major cognitive disorders, dementias are uh, present in five to 7% of the population in uh, the aging population in most world regions, although the numbers are all over the place, I must say. Uh, there were probably 35 million such adults worldwide in 2010. Uh, the number is expected to double every 20 years. And so there is a significant uh, issue to be addressed. In 2010, 58% of all people with major neurocognitive disorders lived in lower and middle income countries. This number is anticipated to rise to 71% by 2050. And there's some estimates of 65 to 70% by 2030. So this is actually a tsunami of elderly with uh, significant cognitive disorders. And one of the reasons I'm passionate about trying to educate about this. And unfortunately, there are no such data about minor neurocognitive disorders. And, and those are, are pretty prevalent also. And we can talk about that in a little bit, as I mentioned. But it's very important that we have no idea um, about the existence or impact of these disorders in lower and middle income countries. OK, so the clinical footprint, the rates are 10% at age 65, 50% over 85, so it increases rapidly. Uh, it's best, best conceptualized as major end organ disease or brain failure. Uh, it's a long-term incurable terminal illness, and their survival is really no different than other major uh, systemic problems, such as COPD, cognitive, excuse me, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder or disease, congestive heart failure, or cancer. 75% of people with uh, major cognitive disorders die of pneumonia, 
and the delirium rate is 85 to 100 percent in terminal phases. So this is not a, a, a calm or malignant end uh, to these people who s have suffered from this for many years. There are also significant rates of pain up to 50 percent. So DSM-5 does provide some helpful innovations for us, which is the new diagnostic manual. Uh, Relabeling to neurocognitive disorder um, minimizes stigma, hopefully, although in places with low health literacy, the term will, of course, be confusing. But useful is that DSM-5 emphasizes retained abilities instead of deficits, themselves redefined as declines. And this couldn't be more important as it helps everyone understand that the person suffering from the disorder still retains value and demands respect. Uh, also important is that early memory loss is no longer an initial criterion given the vagueness of the term and, and its loose usage in general. So specific changes of foci, DSM-4, the previous manual that was in, in existence for about 20 years, emphasized uh, memory and aphasia, apraxia, and agnosia as being common across all major disorders. And I have to say that I always found that mystifying because those triple A's were the least obvious deficits uh, most often. DSM-5 puts forth more of an interactional view with complex attention, executive dysfunction, and social cognition and learning being essential along with other commonly understood deficits. Issues with diagnosis. So screening is really not considered as cost effective as putting resources toward those with obvious early signs. And without epidemiological evidence, it's difficult to convince anyone about the scope of the problem. Sorry, this is okay. Um, intervention in the earliest stages is important to limit the impact for obvious reasons. Uh, but we need to think about the fact uh, that major disorders may appear in somewhat different ways in places that have few healthcare resources. So it may be most effective to assess for cognitive impairment in specific populations, such as those with already identified significant vascular diseases, such as diabetes and hypertension. So Alzheimer's dementia is probably responsible um, to bet for about 60 to 80% of uh, all major cognitive disorders, although this number varies also. Um, it's characterized by memory loss, language impairment, visuospatial problems, um, such as orientation and praxis, and these are primary signs. Uh, plaques and tangles are characteristic of the accumulation of extracellular insoluble amyloid, which are plaques, and interneuronal neurofibrillary tangles, which are tau protein derivatives. Um, are characteristic of the cellular and in extracellular pathology of Alzheimer's dementia. Vascular uh, neurocognitive, dis major neurocognitive disorders, uh, vascular causes uh, occur in, uh, people's, in people in their 70s in two to 3%, 20 to 25% among those uh, 85 and older. Overall, they probably account for 10 to 20% of all dementias. Um, these are characterized by cognitive slowing, motor dysfunction and motor signs, uh, vascular pathology, uh, systemic, and they're progressive. In other words, they're not just the result of one CVA or, or cerebrovascular accident that may actually uh, not progress um, in some people who have simply had that one manifestation of vascular disorder. But most important is that the pathologies of um, Alzheimer's dementia and vascular dementia are most often mixed uh, when you do pathological uh, assessment. And this makes sense because Alzheimer's dementia is a parenchymal disorder. In other words, a disorder of neurons themselves. Vascular disorder is a disorder of the supply to those cells. So if the vascular uh, uh, system is inadequate, the parenchymal system uh, can't really survive very well. So it's very uh, reasonable that they would, the pathologies would be mixed. Uh, frontal lobe major disorder, often called frontotemporal or PICS disease um, in general, is characterized by disinhibition and inappropriate social interactions. Um, it's often viewed as a personality disorder. And it may be either passive or, uh, these people may be either quite passive or impulsive with very poor judgment and insight and lacking the capacity to interact in any sane way with others. They may be profane and actively rude and inappropriate in ways that their relatives have never observed before. 
Notably, the behavioral changes may occur well before the other signs, which causes much dismay among their friends and relatives. So just a brief story here. A number of years ago, I saw a small article hidden in the paper uh, that I was reading, and I uh, just happened to notice it. it said something about a 91-year-old being arrested for bank robbery. Actually, what had happened uh, was that this upstanding citizen, a very uh, responsible person, had always been kind and considerate of others, at the age 91, had robbed a bank. So unfortunately, they put him in jail instead of in a hospital. But clearly, this kind of personality change uh, before any other signs of, of memory impairment or anything else that would clue people into the fact that uh, he had a cognitive disorder um, really marked him as a, you know, as a social, uh, a social, you know, problem as opposed to a medical problem. So I think that that's really a very interesting uh, way to think about this. So Lewy body is usually characterized by Parkinsonian symptoms, a waxing and waning chronic delirium-like presentation that is not marked by physiological, medical, or pharmacological causes as most delirium is. It's important that phases of waxing and waning are usually much longer than observed in uh, actual acute delirium. Um, these, in acute delirium, you can see such episodes, as I mentioned in my other uh, presentation, within seconds, whereas in Lewy body, it's often more days to weeks in, in, one, in the, either the more clear or the more impaired phases of this chronic delirial, delirium-like picture. Uh, visual hallucinations are the third unique characteristic, often of small animals or small objects, and typically it has a more malignant course. And this is not working. Okay, Korsakoff syndrome is another uh, really prominent uh, type of dementia. Uh, this is associated with chronic and severe alcohol abuse and is associated with thiamine deficiency. Usually presents with Wernicke symptoms or lateral nystagmus uh, or gaze, lateral nystagmus or gaze restriction that may be fleeting. It's a primary amnestic disorder with few other signs of progressive functional decline with anterograde and retrograde memory impairment uh, aspects. The important thing about this is that it is not progressive. Um, in the Wernicke stage, if you treat with thiamine, you may be able to reverse some of it, but in the Korsakoff stage, uh, th there really is no going back. Uh, Parkinson's disease is another important cause of major disorder. Um, interestingly, it's associated with significant affective problems such as depression and anxiety, and treatment of the depression itself may actually improve some of the motor symptoms. So this is a more complex uh, disorder that is not fully understood yet. Um, in terms of the timeline, uh, what are the overall behavioral signs in all major disorders? We can separate them into independent activities of daily living and activities of daily living. The independent activities, which support the ability to satisfy basic daily needs, are more likely to be culturally related, such as the ability to obtain adequate food, to obtain adequate transportation, and to obtain and manage resources. Also, the ability to maintain shelter and clothing. With the progression of illness, Sorry, this is sticking here. Okay, it switched over. There's a significant impact of the ability to attend to one of most, one's most basic physical needs, and these can appear in any order. Eating, toileting, dressing appropriately, bathing, and ambulating independently, and some of these may be more cultural dependent. Then, as major disorder advances, we see profound memory loss, minimal verbal communication, loss of ambulation, and at the end, complete dependency. So the goals of care are very important to clarify so that you know from the family and from that person's prior statements how much intervention they want. And many people prefer to simply not be rescued, to not have life prolonging uh, interventions done, and to simply go naturally. Um, we also see eating problems such as pocketing of food and aspiration disorders, disturbed sleep, aggression, and incontinence. And these are some of the most impactful complications. Infections are very common, including urinary and respiratory tract infections. And that is, uh, there is, uh, 
deterioration, and as I mentioned, often delirium toward the end. The overall risks for major disorders, strongest evidence include low education in early life, and this is worldwide from everything I've read, hypertension in midlife, smoking, and diabetes, in which the risk is doubled. And interestingly, rural existence was previously thought to be a risk factor due to possible impact on education, but newer studies indicate that this is not necessarily a specific risk. So this is sort of an equal opportunity disorder between rural, rural and urban uh, populations. In terms of prevention, uh, crucial ages are the fourth and fifth decades, uh, which should emphasize uh, efforts to prevent and control obesity, hypertension, and diabetes, and uh, dyslipidemia. And these interventions are likely to have the maximum impact on maintaining brain health. Costs, uh, probably $81 billion uh, US worldwide in 2015. That itself was an increase of 35% since 2010. 86% um, of the costs, or that is payments uh, that support the care, occur in high income countries, of course, due to resource availability. Uh, the threshold of US uh, trillion dollars in 2018. So this is a highly impactful illness and uh, will require a tremendous amount of investment and understanding and education to really uh, maintain the ability to uh, address it, uh, especially in lower, lower and middle income countries. Foci of intervention, these include education about the, the illness, planning for needs of care, helping the family grasp the loss of identity, and addressing internal family conflicts. Um, there's a tremendous amount of guilt, shame, and blame in all cultures um, and about these problems. Uh, pain must be addressed. And above all, to help the family understand it's not the patient's fault or theirs, to minimize uh, criticism and uh, stigmatization. Treatments, um, not much. Addressing the underlying vascular, vascular illness, such as diabetes and hypertension, again, this would be best done earlier in life. There can be some mitigation if you uh, try to address these more strictly uh, once the disorder presents, but the gains are less than. Uh, of course, these people need stable housing, food, and support. As we mentioned, uh, they are not able to provide those for themselves uh, due to their impairments in what we call independent activities of daily living. And there are certain cognitive enhancers that can be used, although many of us have mixed feelings about them because we see very little uh, improvement uh, on them and they are costly and they're an additional medication to try to get an older person to take who may not understand why they need to take medication. There's memantine, uh, which can improve uh, cognitive function due to impact on uh, free radicals. We start with five milligrams and increase it uh, every three to four weeks, up to 20 milligrams per day as BID doses. So five, and then five, and then five, and 10, and then 10, and 10 uh, BID. There's a revestigmine patch of the, um, of the other group of uh, cognitive enhancers, cholinesterase inhibitors. And um, this probably has the most frequent use at this point. It honestly depends on what you have available. This is started as 4.6 milligrams for a month the nine and a half milligram patch for a month, and then the 13.3 milligram patch. And then there's Dinepazel, uh, otherwise known as Aricep, much more commonly, that starts at five milligrams every night for four weeks, and then 10 milligrams uh, at bedtime. And there are newer, uh, higher doses in the 23 uh, or 28 milligram dose ranges. These two, Revastigmine, Dinepazil, and the cognitive, uh, um, the acetylcholine inhibitor uh, group, uh, supposedly improve the access of acetylcholine to the existing cells. When those cells die, there's really uh, no ability, obviously, for them to work. And then the person's function decreases to the level it would have uh, if these had never been used. So for a while, they can maintain function, but then they lose efficacy. Uh, diagnostic issues, um, older designations primarily related to distinct behaviors, such as activities of daily living or independent activities of daily living. But more recently, we have an awareness of systemic deficits uh, and why they help explain some behavior uh, the, and the reasons for the behaviors, um, which ADLs and IADLs can't do. 
and we're including in this group the impact of impairment in frontal systems, the impact of hearing and vision loss, the impact of postural instability, and the impact of pain. So people's function may be less, even if they're cognitively uh, sharp, if, they're, if their eyesight or hearing are less, they really are more hesitant, they're less likely to take on new behaviors or new tasks, and it can really inhibit their ability to interact with the world in ways that may look like uh, cognitive impairment, but may related, be related much more to sensory impairment. Um, impact of postural instability, this may make people or lead people to feel more hesitant about uh, walking, about heading even uh, to the bathroom to take care of their, uh, their bathing and other needs. Uh, we have to really think about these things very concretely before we assume that they're all related to cognitive impairment. Pain itself can, of course, limit a person's willingness to stand up and walk or to even move around in ways that are needed to take care of themselves personally. So why is it actually helpful to clarify the reasons for behavior? Then the behavior makes more sense. So the person is seen, seen as less irrational and unpredictable. This is one of the reasons, I think, why they're so, uh, so stigmatized. Uh, we don't understand some of the behaviors. As I was just mentioning, many of them can be due to specific uh, deficits, uh, and that can help explain some of them. But in general, uh, we have to really think about the presentation among people who are uh, frightened and unable to really cognitively sort out the cause for the fear and, and can be quite frightening to others as a result. But people who understand that particular person's history or, or who observe them closely can deduce specific explanations for their disruptive behavior, which enables better interventions. And I want to give you an example of this. Um, I worked in our veterans uh, hospital system, which is uh, the, the hospital system that serves uh, people in the military once they've retired from the military. So there's a tremendously high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder and there are fewer resources. So we often see people residing in the hospital itself for long periods of time until they can be placed in a nursing home or a care home of, a, of another sort. And a number of them have PTSD, which makes it very hard for them to be confined in this way. So um, recently, um, I observed a situation where understanding that person's behavior and their background really could help uh, mitigate their suffering and the impact on the environment around them. This was a 92-year-old man who was in the hospital, long stay, waiting for placement, history of post-traumatic stress disorder, and significantly demented with very significant um, uh, memory loss. So he was causing a disruption on the floor by attempting to leave the floor, and he was certainly not capable of leaving on his own. So three to four times a day, there would be an emergency code called, as we, as we refer to it. 15 to 20 people would come running in and, and subdue him, often give him medication, which would frighten him even more. And then they would leave and he'd be completely bewildered about why he wasn't able to leave the unit. So uh, a wonderful neuropsychologist uh, that I worked with at the time was able to put together a plan. He said to me frequently, pointing out the window, my family is right over there, over the hill. And he said this repeatedly. She then observed that he would spend a lot of time organizing the food in the containers on his tray, his lunch tray. So she put this together and what she ended up doing was printing out a number of bus tickets from 1965, which he would recognize. And then because the ward was set up in such a way that there was a ward clerk who sat behind a window to answer questions by patients and physicians and other clinicians that looked very much like a ticket window. So these tickets uh, were, were given to the ward clerk. The patient had some money put into his wallet. And whenever he asked to go home, uh, one of the nurses would suggest that he buy a ticket uh, on a bus uh, for the bus, which would leave tomorrow, not today. So he would go and buy the ticket, he'd give the money that had been put into his wallet by the nurses, get the ticket, and then he would be told, so why don't you go back to your room and pack your things so you, you will be all ready to leave tomorrow. Again, you can't leave today. So he would go back to his room and there he would find two suitcases that had been donated by the director of nursing of the hospital and quite a number of old clothing. And he would then proceed to fold up the clothing and put it in the suitcase and then be told, that's wonderful, you're all ready to go tomorrow when the bus comes. And this would be uh, repeated a number of times during the day. And actually he was much happier. There were no emergencies called. I think he only tried to leave once uh, 
and this lasted seven months, which seems almost incredible, but that just shows you that memory impairment can actually help you in the care of some of these people. But he, his pride was, was uh, returned to him. He had a specific thing to do that could enable him to take care of his own needs, and uh, there were no more frightening interventions. So it was really quite effective the interesting thing about this was that he neither recognized that the suitcases were not his and that the clothing was not his. So this is where the frontal lobe impairment in terms of understanding, you know, one's context and having, you know, insight about your needs and what, what things are yours and what are not could actually help. He simply saw that they were clothes in a suitcase and this really was very helpful to him. So this is, to me, one of the best examples of how to use understanding of that person's uh, background behavior, uh, his loyalty to his family, uh, his post-traumatic stress disorder that made it so hard for him to remain in the hospital uh, and frightened by being in the hospital, uh, could help us set up something that would really uh, calm his behavior, relieve this, the award of a tremendous amount of stress and impact, and help him preserve his dignity. So that's, uh, that's the kind of intervention that we would love to see, but it takes a lot of work, takes a lot of observation, and in this case, took a number of people. But this is the, an ideal kind of approach uh, to someone who can express their own needs and really doesn't understand uh, when you say to them, no, we can't do that at this point. You're, you're not allowed to leave. Uh, it simply does not make sense to them. There are medications, the cognitive enhancers, as mentioned above, and these are what we call disease modifying. In other words, they can change the overall course of the illness, at least for a while, such as with the cholinesterase inhibitors, or overall, possibly with memantine. And the other medication uses, we have to be clear, are purely symptomatic, and these are for situations where the behavior is acutely dangerous, where the person cannot be calm, is aggressively attacking others, or at risk of hurting themselves, and of course, situations where behavioral analysis or intervention, such as I described, just does not work. Uh, we can't think of the right intervention or it's simply not impactful enough. And then that person really needs medication in order to help control their behavior sufficiently that we can take care of, it, of them as well as minimize their danger to uh, themselves and others. As you can imagine, people who are uh, elderly with dementia can seem very frightening. Uh, to others. And if they are also aggressive, they may tend to get less attention in homes or in hospitals or any other healthcare settings. And that's not healthy for them, of course, and it really impedes care. So sometimes medication uh, really is essential for their care and, and uh, overall safety. So medications for behavior, we should remember these are highly toxic to the elderly brain and we use them sparingly and only as long as needed. And these are the antipsychotics and atypical antipsychotics. Risperidone or haloperidol are typical examples of atypical and typical antipsychotics. We start very low with a quarter of a milligram to, uh, sorry, an eighth of a milligram to a quarter of a milligram per day to start. And their main purpose is if the patient has specific psychotic ideation. Um, they, if they have uh, paranoid fears, these may be more, much more helpful than anything else we can do to limit the impact of, that, of those fears on their behavior. Uh, there's really no substitute if someone is psychotic for an antipsychotic uh, as, uh, as impactful as they can be to the brain. Uh, quetiapine is an atypical antipsychotic, and this is extremely useful for calming people's agitation and overall fearfulness. I found it to have great uses and to be uh, capable of improving that person's quality of life such that regardless of the risks of these medications, uh, most families decide that it's well worth it. Again, the lowest uh, pill size is 25 milligrams. It's tiny. Nonetheless, I try to start with a quarter of one pill, 25 milligram pill to a half per day to start. And sometimes you have to ask the pharmacy to kind of mix this into a solution so it's easier to measure. But these people's brains are limited. They have, their brains are smaller and they're vulnerable. So uh, we often need tiny doses of these medications. You can increase as needed, but you'd be surprised by how many people really respond to such low doses. And then there's Depakote or Valproic Acid. And this is a very good medication I found to control um, in, impulsive behavior, such as we observe in frontal lobe uh, dementias. Um, by the way, I don't think I mentioned it, but frontal lobe signs can be seen in almost all dementias because almost all dementias uh, impact the frontal lobe. Uh, 
Um, anyhow, um, so Depakote is very useful to decrease a uh, person's uh, aggression if, they're, if they appear to be, uh, it's not related to fearfulness or trying to get others away from you, but simply uh, because the person is disinhibited. I start with 125 milligrams at night. Uh, you can go up. Some people need as much as 1,000 milligrams. That's unusual. 125 to 375 milligrams per day are usually sufficient. So let me go back for a moment to the risks in case they are not known uh, in this context of the psychotics and antipsychotics, uh, particularly, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, the atypical and typical uh, antipsychotics. Particularly, the atypicals um, are known to have an increased risk of mortality either from cerebrovascular or cardiovascular uh, events. Uh, there's also a significant tendency toward metabolic uh, disorder, which involves hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, and weight gain. And of course, these are not uh, healthy in, in any older adults who are already compromised. So these are the risks. But nonetheless, there's no substitute for an antipsychotic when, you, when a person is acutely psychotic and could be helped by them, or for, for a person who is so agitated and disorganized that they really can't participate at all in their own care, and it's hard for others to help them, in which case we think about uh, quetiapine. The medications I have not uh, indicated here that are in these classes often have too much um, anticholinergic impact to be useful for people with uh, dementia. So these are the ones that I, I recommend. So now we go to minor neurocognitive disorders. Um, and this sort of accounts for what lies between the full-blown major disorder and normal aging. At what point do we consider memory loss to be a problem? Um, when do we start worrying about further progression? Um, this, is, this is really a very important issue. Uh, of obviously so that we can intervene as early as possible, but we also don't want to pathologize normal behavior. So the importance of this relates to the predictability of the progression to major disorders, and that's very important to understand. There have been a number of advances in epidemiologic, neuroimaging, and biomarker research over the last 17 to 20 years, and this has really helped us to specify these substates of impaired cognition, uh, more common designations are amnestic and non-amnestic uh, minor disorder, progressive and non-progressive uh, minor disorder. Um, and the criteria are moderate cognitive decline. And this has to be measurable to some extent and not due to any other mental disorder. Uh, and it can include any of the aspect of memory, attention, language, perception, learning, and social cognition. But the most critical point I will make about this is that only about a third of these progress to major uh, neurocognitive disorder. So again, we do not want to over-pathologize uh, any of these early signs. So now we'll go to neurocognitive disorders in lower and middle income countries. So aspects of the problem, number one, um, in certain cultures, major disorders are considered facts of aging, and when resources are limited, those with major disorders may be passed by in favor of assisting those who offer more material benefit to the family. And any degree of disability in Lamix can impose life-threatening consequences to the family, and as noted above, accusations about uh, poor care of that person, neglect or abuse. Other aspects, healthcare is, in most uh, countries is oriented toward acute or not, and not chronic disorders, especially in high income countries. The potential impact of cognitive disorders may not be understood, which further limits the prioritization of resources. Um, and finally, excuse me, let me just go back for a moment. Um, finally, the productivity and experience of sidelined able elders is often lost, which compounds, compounds resource limitations in lower and middle income countries. So these are all things we, may, uh, we need to consider when we think about resource allocation in, in the mix. So the mortality rates for people with major uh, neurocognitive disease in lower and middle income countries is significantly higher than those found in high income countries, 1.56 to 5.69 times, depending on the study that you look at. So this is really highly significant. And again, draws into, uh, uh, into question how resources are distributed. Uh, in my experience, in a number of uh, Lamex, resources are aimed toward uh, maternal and child health and infectious diseases. But these uh, non-communicable diseases such as uh, that involve cognitive impairment will have a major impact 
as we've discussed, and we really have to think about how to, how to arrange resources as limited as they are to try to address these problems. If nothing else, uh, the, if the, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, if the family member who is most functional is required to stay home and away from productive work to take care of that elder, the family uh, livelihood can really be uh, very disastrously impacted. So uh, the issue of caregiving, which I'll discuss in a minute, uh, becomes very important as well. And in the mix, increasing rates of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension worsens the risks. So we have to be very aware of these trends if we're going to limit any of the vascular impact uh, to these disorders. So what work is being done? Uh, it's actually very interesting. The 1066 study was started in 1998 by Martin Prince at King's College London um, to inform the development and implementation of policies for improving the health of older people in Lemix. 1066 means that only 10% of the research resources um, of, uh, that include study and investigation of this work is being devoted to the 66% of people who live in lower and middle income countries. I'm not sure where they got the 10% from, I have to say, because I think the investment in these problems in Limix is much less, but that is the, that is the name, <laughs> that is how they address the study. So who is Martin Prince? He's a professor of epidemiological psychiatry at King's College London, and I bring him up because he is the major uh, name and, and person responsible for a lot of the, uh, the knowledge that we have about the risk and um, uh, importance of mental and neuro, um, neurological disorders or non-cognitive disorders, um, excuse me, um, non-communicable non-communicable diseases that we find in Lemix. Um, he, has, uh, he has a focus on aging, dementia, and other chronic disease in these areas, and he has coordinated the uh, 1066 Dementia Research Group, a network of researchers mainly from Lemix, and he's gone out of his way to try to include uh, local researchers in all the work he, uh, researchers in all the work he's done. Um, his and their work covers dementia prevalence, incidence, etiology, and impact in caregiving. So they have laid out a, a, a large amount of information about uh, the prevalence of the dis these disorders and some of the local uh, um, risks or problems that may predispose to them in different areas of the world uh, that are, have not been studied before. His work has been uh, part of the World Health Organization World Dementia Report in 2012. He was one of three editors for the 2007 Lancet series in global mental health, and he coordinated the development of the World Health Organization Mental Health Gap Action Plan, uh, MHGAP, uh, Clinical Guidelines for Dementia Care by non-specialists in lower and middle income countries. So this has really been very significant uh, assistance to this whole area. And I bring it up in some detail so that you will be able to uh, use the 1066 study and the, the papers uh, associated with it, of which there are more than 200, as resources uh, of great value when you're trying to learn more about this uh, in your own specific uh, situation. So one of the other things that, uh, one of the other areas where this has, has been addressed is a Tanzanian study by Richard Walker's group. It's one of the few places that has looked in great detail over the last 20 years to assess their prevalence, validate scales, and develop treatment interventions in their uh, um, underserved area. And it's, they've extended it to delirium, and importantly, much of the work that they've done has been in rural areas. When I look through the literature in, in, uh, on uh, non-communicable diseases, um, uh, including cognitive disorders, almost all of it has been done uh, in urban hospitals or large teaching hospitals, and almost none in rural areas, which, which is where 80% of people living in Lemix live. So this is extremely important work as well and really groundbreaking. So in terms of caregivers, uh, the basic findings are that caregiver stress is extremely high, even in studies that look at uh, extended family uh, resources that we observe in, in uh, many countries where uh, the uh, the younger generation is, is, has less opportunity to move away to urban settings. So even in areas where there are extended families, caregiving imposes a huge toll. Uh, oops. Most caregivers are women, um, and withdrawing from income-generating work, as I mentioned, can basically destroy families' welfare. 
Uh, there are few epidemiological studies on the impact on caregivers, although there is some within the 1066 group. Um, and depression is known in high income countries to be a major result of caregiving with up to 50% suffering uh, major depressive illness and even higher rates of, of uh, caregivers having some suicidal ideation. This is pretty well established. So this is a very significant uh, issue in terms of uh, uh, the care of major and minor cognitive disorders. So that is the end of the presentation. I just want to acquaint you with a few scales that have uh, some international validation. There's a World Health Organization disability assessment schedule called the WHODAS, which helps us understand who's most vulnerable. The informant report of neuropsychiatric inventory, the NPIQ, which can help diagnose uh, cognitive impairment. The community screening instrument for dementia. This has uh, robust cross-cultural settings measurement properties and is adaptable, again, internationally validated. And there's also the CIRAD 10-word memory test, which is also culturally adaptable, which is a, some, uh, assist, gives you some assistance in assessing cognitive impairment. There are a number of others uh, that have been um, validated internationally that doesn't help you in a specific local area, but at least it is, a, it is a start and you could then adapt it from there. Although validating scales in any culture is, is a fairly uh, um, intensive process that requires a significant amount of time. So when you can use a, an internationally validated scale, it's extremely helpful. And those are the resources. So that is the end of the presentation. Here are some of the resources that I found uh, that may be helpful to you in this area. And the 1066 Project, I highly recommend, is, is a very good source of uh, understanding about dementia in the mix. Um, although the Alzheimer's Disease International uh, is also an extremely important source. And of course, uh, general information about dementia in older people. And I give you an update there that's fairly succinct. So that is the end. Thank you so much for listening.